Celebrating 17 years of Young Turks. Founded in 2008 in Pune, Dhruva started its life as a data protection and security product for endpoint devices or what we now call the Edge. By 2012, Dhruva had moved its headquarters to Sunnyvale, California and also based on client requests, started to look at data security and management on the cloud. Today, Dhruva is leveraging on its core strengths to position itself as a data management as a service platform. Dhruva's AI-aided platforms collect data, unify backup and disaster recovery and bring intelligence onto a single pane view for CIOs and CTOs. With over 4,000 clients largely in the US and Europe and closing in on revenues of close to $100 million, Dhruva's co-founder and CEO, Jaspreet Singh, is held up as a poster boy of the global B2B SaaS play out of India. The last time uh, we spoke back in 2014, uh, you know, I asked you this question about how big is the market that Dhruva is servicing and that was a time of, uh, you know, internal change at Dhruva. You all were moving away from just servicing endpoint data management uh, on devices and you all were finding your feet on the cloud. In the last four years, we are in 2019 now, uh, you firmly established yourself uh, on the cloud. Tell us a little bit about that journey in the last four or five years. The first time we looked at cloud or uh, AWS as a, as a core backend and servicing customers as a SaaS platform was 2012 to 13 period. Um, the, the notion of cloud to store enterprise data was still fairly, fairly young. So cu customers were not, you know, very, very uh, comfortable with the idea of putting cloud to store data. And the, the first opportunity we got was, um, can, I, can I have my end user data, my endpoint data being managed by Dhruva, uh, the whole life cycle of data being managed by Dhruva from the cloud. Uh, we, we, we jumped on the opportunity, we, we went deep into it, mm. and I think the market came our way. And then eventually the market again evolved to say, I'm, I'm actually spinning up all these workloads in the cloud now with Office 365, Salesforce, Amazon. Can you help me manage that data? So it became a whole 360 degree uh, data. Data is getting everywhere and anywhere. And, mm. and how do I get a single pane of glass to manage all my data for all its life cycle? Mm. Uh, became Drua's really core value proposition. Today we think the at the core of data management is a market called data protection, which is the most well-defined market data protection, which is purely business resiliency, backup recovery, disaster recovery. It's about $18 billion. Okay. Uh, and when you look at data management overall, which is you know data protection plus uh, long-term archival, you have legal risk, compliance. If you put it all together, it's about $30 billion. Very, very, f one of the very few markets to have about six to seven billion dollar products uh, out there. Okay. So really interesting market to be in. Since Dhruva holds about a, a hundred petabyte today of data from about 4,000 customers, can you help us mine information to find some deep dive forensics challenges, business challenges? Uh, since, we have, since we have known about the companies over several years, we are very well positioned to solve those. That's the future direction we are hmm. getting into. All right, so before we talk about that future direction that you'll take, let's talk about the present a little bit. If I've understood correctly, Dhruva uh, is available and you work primarily only on AWS, Amazon uh, Web Services, as a preferred partner. In fact, you're one of their top five uh, partners. Give us a sense of why this conscious decision to service only um, AWS in an area where we now have Azure, we have the Google Cloud Platform uh, as well. Uh, then there is, of course, uh, Nutanix and the whole hyper-converged infrastructure ecosystem. Why the conscious decision uh, to restrict yourself just to AWS? First of all, we started off thinking public cloud. Public cloud as a way to disrupt data management itself because the, the data was being managed in multiple hardware, multiple <coughs> software the enterprise collaboration around data wasn't happening in the legacy systems. Okay. We had to re rethink about how to manage data, so we thought public cloud, and Amazon was the best example. Since then, I think they, 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 they still deliver the best value when it comes to hmm. build on a platform approach. Hmm. I think Microsoft is great when it comes to offering a ready-made application as a build on, delivered on okay. platform. Amazon is a good, good platform. 
When customers deal with Druva, they only deal with Druva. We abstract out all the complexities of a public cloud to offer a simple service, Correct. SLA, to be delivered anywhere in the globe. So they actually don't really care. They do care it's a it's a tier one cloud, but don't, they don't really, really care if it's which cloud do we use till the point we can deliver the value. And, uh, and our stack is very, very built. We can go to other clouds, but there isn't a big advantage and leverage today to be porting our cloud on multiple platforms. Why we do you say that? Why do you say that? Given that, if I've read it correctly, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, CTOs, CIOs do want to disperse risk, right? So we are moving into a multi-cloud environment and where uh, earlier there was a few years back, there was even a thought that everything would migrate to the cloud. Uh, On-prem is also becoming equally important. Some numbers suggest that even by 2030, we might actually just have about 30% uh, data residing uh, on any sort of public cloud, correct? So in that environment, isn't sticking with just one large player, albeit the largest player, uh, restrictive for you as a business? I think most, most good companies are built on one unfair advantage. Okay. Right, and and uh, not doing everything, but doing one thing really well, which okay. nobody else would place their bets on. It's not as relevant to Druva to hedge our bets okay. than to bet on the most promising trend. At Druva, we believe that in next ten years, sixty percent data may be in in fifty maybe in cloud, okay, uh, and thirty forty percent on prem. Okay, we believe private cloud is simply a bad joke. It just okay. becomes. That said. The biggest growth is still coming from the, the migration to public cloud. Correct. And it's important for us to place our bets on a few interesting trends right. which are growing in the future okay. then maybe shrinking in the future. All right. and, um, so what are the trends that are shrinking uh, in the future and what are the trends that are growing in the future? And uh, tell us this in the context of Dhruva and your business. It's a great question. So let's think about it, right? Um, if I'm a betting man, I would think that the trend on there will not be a center to a data center left. Okay. You will you will not have, uh, especially especially when it comes to Asia Pacific. Okay. You should not have huge investments any which ways. There was never an entity or a Belgacom or a BT right. for Asia, right? In so India. The course. biggest was yeah. entity, but even then only Japan, right? So cloud will become the platform for most modern companies to innovate on. Another strong growth trend, which will sort of piggyback on cloud is the whole trend about data science and machine learning. Okay. Uh, data science and machine learning, uh, the, the nature of data science and machine learning will itself become a commodity, just like mobile. Everybody will have an access to it. Uh, but data science will always depend upon data. And data will depend upon a center of gravity. Okay. And I think for center of gravity, for innovation and next gen of data, mm. which people will create care to create now yeah. will be all be in the cloud. All right. Uh, these are two big trends we are we are banking on. All right. So your focus on machine learning and data science is stem from there. And you said in an interview actually that you see machine learning as the AI of things and that this is an area that you will double down on, not just in terms of uh, R&D to develop products, but also as uh, an area that will become core to your business maybe five or seven years down the line. Let me give an example, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> the first part of AI of things is more about making simple tasks better. For example, okay. today, if you have to uh, put a backup policy or archival policy in something, you just using your uh, peer knowledge or your uh, enterprise insight saying 9 p.m. looks good hmm. and then seven years of retention looks good, right? Hmm. Machines could do a much better job. They could understand network, understand disk, understand human nature, understand data type, industry type, and then build a recommendation that, you know, let's okay. just do it more intelligent. Okay. And these will be small, uh, invisible features hmm. throughout the products to make the overall software smarter, which is what we call AI of things. Right? Hmm. Second area are a deep understanding. Let's take an example of blood testing, right? Okay. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm a company collecting blood samples hmm. for testing, right? Uh, for privacy reasons now, I would need to gather consent, that I'm, I have a consent to use your blood samples for so-and-so of testing, because data gets sold multiple times over to multiple vendors. Right. Right? The whole consent management gets lost because 
it's very hard to sometimes understand data and it changes form and factor. There's no prescribed way to understand blood samples, right, in, in right. data form. Uh, so how do you understand data beyond just the file type, looks and feel of it to understand it is actually a, a blood sample report Hot. with a consent form attached to it to really drive who can actually access it. Those are deeper challenges, hmm. repetitive and deeper challenges machine learning can easily solve. So privacy, deep analysis of data for privacy uh, could be a very big domain. Uh, as someone who sits out of uh, California, uh, I think 70% of your business comes from there. Uh, Europe is a big market for you. You're now looking to double down on India as well. Have you kept up with uh, the data privacy, data localization debates and you know white papers that have been coming out here in India? Uh, as a nation where you mm -hmm. said yourself, Asia Pac will actually make that leap to cloud. Uh, data privacy, data localization are becoming sort of heated areas of conversation and debate here. Can you give us a, a sense of how you view uh, policy taking shape here? We at Drua believe that more and more companies will go the route of China and US. US had the Patriot Act of calling back data, ITAR and the whole compliance and China has no, uh, you know, data localization laws and now we have GDPR. In think, Europe, yes. In Europe, yes. Actually, for European citizens across the globe. Across the world, across yes. The world. In fact, we did a small experiment. We we sent three companies, three large companies, an email saying, "You have our data. You have my data. Can you delete it?" And we got very interesting responses from all three of them. One says, "Prove you are a European citizen." Okay. Second said, "We have no understanding of your data," and third said, "We have no capability to do it." So, uh, interesting, <laughs> interesting take there. But coming back to the topic of also privacy. Also three big areas of work exactly. uh, for a company like Dhruva possibly. Possibly, exactly. So we're trying to understand how much companies do really understand privacy. I think uh, Enron has to happen again for people to get serious about privacy. But the world we're is... We're seeing Facebook happening. If that, that's not making us serious enough, I don't know what will. Facebook is, uh, I think they will make an example of one company. Facebook dodged the bullet. Okay. Um, in, in my opinion, I think, um, but nonetheless, we see the world going in the direction of give me the global technology, but in a hyper local form. Uh, uh, there's a high possibility of India going the same route, uh, which is well understood. The only, only catch there is that when it comes to IP or data, import, export, localizations are not very easy problems to understand. For example, I use my Uber app, I'm traveling from US to, to India. When it comes to data, right, is it my data as a US citizen or is it my data as a person of Indian origin? Is it the driver's data who took the ride or is it corporate data which is trying to understand and analyze who took a ride to where, right? So uh, the import, export, the IP boundaries are hard. Localization of data isn't uh, as bad as it may sound. It just have to be aware that it's just a very hard thing to pin down and manage because there's so much things shared and interconnected between people across the globe. But yeah, I th I'm, I'm, I'm pretty okay. hopeful that this, is, this will be a, a positive move for the country and, and the world overall. Celebrating 17 years of Young Turks. As enterprises globally continue to adopt the public cloud, not just for data storage and security, but for mission critical workloads too, Dhruva, co-founded by Jaspreet Singh in 2008, sees itself as a leader in the data management as a service space, providing enterprises with a full-stack solution for all their data needs, security, governance and intelligence. Dhruva has raised over $200 million in venture capital from the likes of Sequoia, Nexus Venture Partners, Tenaya and Riverwood Capital and continues to invest in tech and R&D at its thousand-person strong team in Pune, as well as taking market share away from large incumbents like EMC, Veritas, VM, and others. Jaspreet, I want to now talk to you about the competitive landscape in which you function, mm -hmm. uh, correct? Uh, would you say that you were one of the first players to get into data management as a service, uh, and that, as we spoke about, has, you know, uh, three different components. One is the protection, one is the analytics recovery, and one is the intelligence part of it. But the competitive landscape around you uh, has sort of also 
churned. So you have Rubrik, you have Cohesity, you have a company called VM uh, that's also working in this space. Can you give us a sense of how you view that competition? Some of these players are unicorns. Uh, I believe you're also almost getting there. Uh, but give us a sense of what differentiates you from some of these players. The reason this industry has competition is because 64% of market share is still dominant by three to four players. EMC, IBM, Veritas, and Commvault and others, right? So, and, and they haven't innovated in the light of cloud as much as they should have. Correct. And they're losing market share. Uh, to players like yourself. To players like myself or others, right? The one unfair advantage Druva has right, is it's still centered around the notion of offering a SaaS platform mm. uh, to solve this whole broad nature of data management. Mm. Most of our competition is 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 improving, uh, really really improving, uh, building the the, gen the the next the next generation of uh, software to manage data on hardware, software, some components which you can host or build or buy. Mm. Uh, Druva is the generation after, mm. which is. Uh, building a SaaS platform mm. which you can deploy globally in an instant, uh, much better time to market, okay. cost agility, uh, go to market speed which you can deliver mm. as a SaaS platform. And the customer depending on their journey to cloud may either like us or hate us, it's a binary uh, equation. Mm. And if they, they do want to go public cloud and they like the idea of SaaS, they're the only option. All right. If they want to stay in private cloud or hybrid cloud or any other clouds, then they look at Veeam or Rubrik or CoST or many other options out there. Okay, two questions here, uh, Jaspreet. One is, in that context, can you give us a sense of, of the 4,000 clients that mm -hmm. you have, how many of them have moved up the chain with you? Correct. Can you give us a sense of how many use just still in sync the endpoint product? How many of them are using the full stack? What is the contribution to revenue? Give us a break that down for us so that we're able to understand uh, that journey that Drua wants each of their 4,000 clients to embark on with them. Full stack is still pretty small. I think full stack is still 11 to 12 percent. Okay. I think part of the reason is we haven't made that big push on the on the full stack just yet. Why not? Given the buyers sometime and the, and the level of maturity and the level of market understanding and their own maturity to adapt multiple parts is low. And whenever you build a business plan to put a new product on an existing, you know, slap the new product on an existing base, you don't give the new product a life of its own. Okay. So you have to you have to make the new product standard stand okay. on its own, All right. mature, and then the cross sell will naturally happen. happen. The mistake companies make is to say, I'm gonna build something new to just keep on slapping on my existing customers. So the big push is yet to happen. Okay. We have, we have naturally, organically really built a good base. And then, okay. now the adoption will happen. All right. And the other question that uh, related to the competitive landscape, and you broke that down for us well, but I come back to that question also in a $30 billion market, mm -hmm. and we discussed that this is, you know, uh, this can keep growing. We don't know uh, where this $30 billion is going to be in the next uh, 10 years, correct? Mm -hmm. The sky is the limit. Uh, is there enough space right now for three or four unicorns, Rubrik is already one, the others might well be on their way. You are almost there uh, yourself. To bump heads? I think this this market is very unique. This has currently over $7 billion revenue products. Okay. Uh, held by hmm. multiple companies, right? Uh, arguably, data domain itself is, is in, in multiple billions. Veritas is two plus billion. Uh, Veeam and Commvault are big and they all are the biggest donors as well. They're giving up market share given the lack of innovation. So this market has absolutely room for many, many, many players to give and coexist, absolutely. All right, what kind of revenues are you at now? I know when I asked you 100 million, you said not yet, but almost there. Uh, those are the kind of revenues that we look at uh, companies, at least in the product space, that are ripe for listing. Is that something that you're looking at actively? The short answer is, uh, you know, yes and yes. We will we'll start to uh, list our more public numbers shortly, after, you know, soon after, right? But the reason most startups don't disclose the, you know, the revenue numbers early on is because, you know, to some larger customers who you serve, Druva has three of Fortune 10 as customers, yeah. right? And we have 38 of Fortune 500 as customers, right? Some of those customers 
are not solely aware of your size, which may give them unfair advantage to negotiate with you. Unfortunately or fortunately, you know, the whole startup landscape is like a Hollywood for geeks, <laughs> right? And, and what's your valuation and what's your revenue becomes a flaunting stance versus, you know, how, what's the quality of revenue? And, and that's why Dhruva never had a down round. We never had any public. We're not trying to compete with the press to give a Correct. number out. Correct. Which, you know, we, we would be, you know, const continuously questioned on and you have to play that game. Okay, fine. So I won't press you on this one. But I will ask you, uh, Jaspreet, as an entrepreneur, you started off in Pune in 2008. Uh, we are in 2019 now. So it's been a 10, 11 year journey for you. What have been some of your most important lessons, if I can break it up, in the first five years of your journey? And what have been some of your most important learnings uh, in the latter half? When I started Druva um, <clears throat> with a core passion to build a product uh, which I wasn't completely aware of yet. Uh, I believe we hit a product market fit in 2012 when we found uh, software built on cloud to be sold for you know, data management, data protection, backup and recovery. And then the next lesson was um, you know, how do you sell to enterprises, uh, not just technology, which I was very familiar with, mm. but the whole product, product. which is uh, the messaging, the positioning, mm. the pre-sales, the post-sales process. So, uh, and that's why being in the US was important for Drova to understand how the, you know, how the game is really played. Uh, because uh, what I learned the most critical was it's not, US is not really good at, as much as good at innovation. Mm -hmm. as scaling innovation, okay. right? how they package and scale innovation was pretty critical there. Um, and, and we scaled rapidly. We scaled rapidly from 29 employees to a few hundred employees in an enterprise space, which is, you know, mm -hmm. which is very good. Um, and then the last two years is all about growth and scale to the level that it's not as important for, for me and mm -hmm. some of core people in the company to, to be the product architects or the customer, the number one customer evangelist, which is still important, uh, but equally important to build a company which will, which will, you know, have a have a strong strength to stand on its own, to hire a strong team, mm. people, mm. Uh, you know, to to build a mm. long-standing, large, scalable organization. Your words of advice to young startup founders that are building product companies. If you just want to summarize from your experience, uh, what would be three of the things that you would like to hold up to them? I think one would be uh, pr focus very, very hard on product market fit. Okay. Not distribution, not sales, not marketing, product market fit. There's nothing which stops, nothing can stop an idea whose time has come. So refine it, refine it, refine it to really get to a, a solid product market fit. Number two would be uh, persistence, which is, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot of glamour behind an overnight success, but as Steve Jobs said, you know, uh, every overnight success takes a long time in happening. And, um, and a third part is probably when the, when the times get tough, when you don't have, uh, you know, hopes on anybody else, uh, between any choices I made to, to raise money, to, uh, to do anything, I think sell more faster. That will solve everything in life. Okay. Uh, just focus on what you do best hmm. in early years building, in the later years selling and selling more faster just solves everything. All right, great. Thank you very much for talking to us today, Jaspreet. Thank you very much. And with that, it's a wrap on Young Turks. Tell us what you thought of the program. You can write to us at youngturks at nw18.com. You can also ping us on Facebook and Twitter. Our handle is at CNBC Young Turks. From the entire team here, thank you very much for watching. Celebrating 17 years of Young Turks.